Welcome to our next video on oxidative phosphorylation. Now, if you've seen some of our other videos, uh, we've really tried to set these up as a series because this is just one of the biochemical pathways in the production of our ATP. As you study these pathways, glycolysis, Krebs, oxidative phosphorylation, and beta oxidation, none of these pathways are standalone. They are individual cogs in a larger ATP producing machine. So if you haven't already, hit the link down below, start with glycolysis, look at how it proceeds into the next video of Krebs, and then a continuation of those two into oxidative phosphorylation. For each molecule of glucose, we can expect to get a total of 36 ATPs. So I want you to recall that from glycolysis, when you watch that video, we got a total of two. We contributed two, we got back four, so we got a net gain of two ATPs. From Krebs, we also got two ATPs. Again, notice that when we talk Krebs, for every glucose we break down, we got to go through Krebs twice. Each turn of Krebs gives us a single ATP, so so far our production is going to be a total of two. We add these together, and of our 36, we've got a grand total of four. So thus far, we're not even close, even though we've gotten through two of our biochemical pathways. The remainder of these ATPs are going to come from our oxidative phosphorylation process. Also called the electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation is going to take place along the inner mitochondrial membrane. If you look at the structure of a mitochondria, it has a double membrane structure. The proteins and enzymes that are going to be talked about in this process are going to be embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the process is going to involve those other products that we saw from glycolysis and Krebs, NADH and FADH2 as we effectively convert those molecules, they're still energetic molecules, those molecules into ATP. The components of the, phosph the, components of the oxidative phosphorylation process are as stated. We have a series of proteins that are bound into that inner mitochondrial membrane. We have D NADH dehydrogenase, other known as complex one. We have succinate dehydrogenase, or complex two. We have cytochrome BC1, complex three, and cytochrome oxidase, complex four. It's easy to see why a lot of students will choose to just remember the, the complex numbers rather than the more complicated names. In between these membrane-bound proteins, we have a pair of proteins that act as a shuttle in between. We have ubiquinone and we have cytochrome C. They will act as an intermediate protein going from the membrane-bound complexes back and forth as we pump electrons through that electron transport system. And then finally, we have our ATP-producing enzyme. Embedded in the mitochondrial membrane, it is what's going to effectively be our ATP producer, as the name suggests. So from here, let's take a little bit closer look at how that oxidative phosphorylation process takes place, and we'll head on over to the whiteboard. Here's a rendition of our oxidative phosphorylation process. And as mentioned previously, we have our NADH dehydrogenase, or complex one. We have our succinate dehydrogenase, or complex two. Our cytochrome BC1, or complex three. Our cytochrome oxidase, complex four. The final embedded protein is our ATP synthase. This is the actual enzyme that's directly involved with the ATP production. Associated with our membrane-bound complexes, we have movable proteins that shuttle back and forth between them, carrying electrons through the electron transport chain. We have our coenzyme Q10 and our cytochrome C. The NADH that came from our glycolysis and Krebs pathways is broken down at complex one into NAD+, and it contributes two electrons to our transport chain. 
they will go through our coenzyme Q10, through complex 3, through our cytochrome C, through complex 4, and eventually back into the inner workings of the mitochondrial membrane. Once they enter, they're going to combine with oxygen and protons to produce water. Consumption of oxygen throughout this process is the reason we are going to consider this to be an aerobic process. Each time an NADH molecule is broken down through this oxidative phosphorylation process and the electrons go through the electron transport chain, each complex is going to contribute to pumping protons outside that inner mitochondrial membrane. At complex 1, we get four protons pumped out. At complex 3, we get another four hydrogens pumped outside. And at complex 4, we get two hydrogen ions pumped out. At complex 2, we get our FADH2 molecules breaking down. Also contributing electrons into the electron transport chain. However, when FADH2 is broken down, Complex 2 will pump out a total of 6 H plus ions. Now, if we see what's happening here, and going back to some of our discussions on energy being transformed from one form to another, we took high energy molecules of NADH and FADH2 and used those to pump protons on the other side of that mitochondrial membrane. This sets up a new type of energy that we haven't introduced yet, energy in the form of a concentration gradient. On the outside of this mitochondrial membrane, we are developing a high concentration of hydrogen, leaving behind a low concentration of hydrogen on the inside. The strength of this concentration gradient is going to set up a process where our hydrogen ions are going to want to diffuse back into that mitochondrial membrane. It's the ATP synthase molecule that's going to allow this to happen. We let our hydrogen diffuse through the ATP synthase, and upon doing so, we transform ADP molecules into high energy ATP molecules, thus completing our oxidative phosphorylation and using our NADH and FADH2 molecules to produce the remainder of the expected 36 ATPs per glucose molecule. Now that we've seen how the NADH and the FADH2 uh, molecules run through that oxidative phosphorylation process and ultimately give us an ATP production. I want us to go back and look at how many ATPs we expect to get. A grand total of 36 per glucose molecule, that up to this point, we only had four. Each FADH2 molecule that runs through oxidative phosphorylation, we expect to get two ATPs. Each NADH molecule that runs through the same process, we expect to get either two or three. There's a little bit of a variation there. So again, let's go back and recall our other processes of glycolysis and Krebs. Krebs and the oxidative phosphorylation process takes place inside the mitochondria. So any products from Krebs that have to also go through oxidative phosphorylation, they're going to be in the same location. Glycolysis, however, took place outside the mitochondria in the cytosol. So we had two molecules of NADH out there that were produced in the cytosol, that if we expect them to go through oxidative phosphorylation, we have to ship them into the mitochondria. And that shipping comes at a cost. So we said that NADHs were either worth two or three ATPs. 
The ones produced outside the mitochondria are only worth two. The ones produced inside from Krebs are the ones that'll be worth three because we lose some of that value by having to expend energy to bring the, the NADHs from glycolysis into the mitochondria where they can go through the oxidative phosphorylation. So here's our, our complete breakdown. Again, if you haven't already, go back and watch the videos on Krebs and glycolysis. But from glycolysis, we directly got two ATPs, directly from that chain. We got two NADHs, which eventually went on to produce four ATPs. These NADHs from glycolysis are only worth two ATPs apiece. We took our pyruvate from glycolysis, brought it into the mitochondria, converted it to acetyl-CoA as a setup for Krebs cycle. From that process, we got two NADH molecules, one per conversion. Those are going to be worth three ATPs each, which gives us a grand total of six for that particular segment. For Krebs cycle, we get to go through it twice, recall, for every molecule of glucose, two cycles of Krebs. We got two ATPs directly from that pair of cycles, six NADHs, which these are worth three apiece to give us a total of 18. We had two FADH2 molecules. Those are worth two ATPs each to give us a total of four. So we add those up, six from glycolysis when all is said and done, six from our conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and 24 from our Krebs cycle. And if you do the math real quick, that should give us our total of 36 ATPs. From a student's perspective, if you are having to calculate these ATPs that are being produced and you're coming up short, I will say that there are two common errors that students wind up making. They either forget part of the processes, so they either forget about this process altogether and they don't count those NADHs, or they forget that we're going through Krebs cycle twice and they only count the products from one cycle of Krebs. So either they forget about the whole portions of, of the, the overall pathway, or they forget that the NADHs from glycolysis are not worth as much as the NADHs that we see in the other pathways. That will give them an incorrect total calculation at the end as well. But this is how we break it down, and we get our total of 36 ATPs. I want to thank you for watching. Hope it helped.